This is all Dolphins talk. Our lads football network. The Miami Dolphins sit currently as the sixth seed in the AFC playoff picture following a win, a much needed win over a bad football team. And again, the Dolphins now one spot up on Indianapolis actually tied as far as the record is concerned. A full game up on Las Vegas, a game and a half on Baltimore. So we'll have our eyes, obviously, on the game against Dallas today. Big game for the Ravens. And then there are the Patriots. Just two games back. A game coming up a week from Sunday in Miami could be huge. We'll talk about all that, including, uh, well, who knows? That's why we have Alan Pupar on the program. Alan, how's everything going? How was the game? I'm I'm here to talk about all kinds of nonsense. All right. Uh, yeah. That's what I want that, here. Yeah. There you go. How was the game? It was another ho-hum uh, affair that the Dolphins handled in terms of beating a bad team that they were supposed to be just like the they Jets, did the Jets. Yeah. Week. yeah. yeah the same deal. That's it. Uh, actually, the most interesting thing that happened in the game really was the, the altercation near the Cincinnati sideline after Mike Thomas decided he needed to ram into Joaquin Grant. Yeah. For a second time before he caught the ball. The first one, actually, the issue wasn't that he, he got there early. The issue was that he lowered his head and, and led with his helmet, despite what Zach Taylor, the Bengals head coach, said the day after the game. I don't know what he saw, but a clear, as, clear as day that, that Mike Thomas lowered his head straight into the sternum of Jakeem Grant on the first one. The second one, clean hit, beautiful to actually form tackle with the shoulder into the into the – the chest area, the only problem was that the ball hadn't gone there yet. And that's kind of against the rules. Well, that, that, so that, 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 that set off. See, I think that would probably clear things up for anybody who didn't watch the game and only watch the highlight because when you watch it, if you're just watching the highlight of that, the second one, and then you see the big brouhaha, you're going, well, I've seen this happen before. What's the big fuss? I mean, okay, he was late. It's not supposed to do that, but why is everybody fighting over it? But like you said, it's because it happened a second time. And that's the whole reason. So, and then Brian, Brian Flores, of course, uh, blew up, which is always nice. It's what you want to see. If you're a Dolphin fan, you want to see your head coach getting into it, getting, you know, sticking up for his players. Oh, no question. And Brian Flores, after the game, was very apologetic. Was like, <laughs> I, I, I should have kept, I should have kept yeah, my composure. Yeah, I should have yeah. kept my poise. It's not what we want, but that's what we want. Flores. <laughs> yeah, you know his players loved it. And somebody actually asked me on Twitter, like, or, or I made the point that the one other coach that the Dolphins have had in their history, and I've seen every one of them except for George Wilson, their first coach, I, I think the only one I can think of that assuredly would have done the same thing Flores did was was Dan Campbell, who was the interim head coach at the end of 2015. Yeah. Uh, Tony Sperano, maybe, uh, very possibly, but I think Dan Campbell, without a doubt, and then Brian Flores, also without a doubt. And and, and th there were some other interesting things that happened in the game that really, speaking of, you know, little incidents that actually did have an effect on the game itself. And that was what happened with Xavier Howard at the end of the first half, uh, really kind of turning the tide a little bit in the game as well. No, it did. And it's strange to look at that moment, considering that the Dolphins outgained Cincinnati by like 200 yards plus in the second half. But what happened at the end of that first half, as you mentioned, was weird. The Bengals were like, they were facing a third down where if they gained no yardage, they'd be facing a 38-yard field goal attempt to go up 10-3 to because they were already up 7-3. to Well, there's an incompletion pass on the sideline to Tyler Boyd that goes over his head. Byron Shove gives him a shove near the sideline. It was a borderline play. Nothing egregious, but borderline. Tyler Boyd didn't like it. Turned around after after his momentum stops carrying him more further and further out of play, except the first guy he comes across, like Xavier Howard, who's by now is the closest to him, shoves him. Then they both do the, sh the shoving high where it's near the face area and all that. Flag comes out. It's on Tyler Boyd. They send it to New York to review. After reviewing it, they decide that both players threw punches. And if you see the replay, there's really nothing that looks like a clear out-and-out -out punch. So really borderline to, to be called to begin with. But then the weird part is that by rule, New York can determine punches and then get them on both sides, but they can't add penalties to the original call. So the original call, which was against Boyd, stands. 
So now instead of a 38-yard field goal, it's a 53-yard field goal attempt, which, oh, by the way, Randy Bullock pushes wide left. Dolphins now get the ball at the 43 with like 35 whatever seconds left in the first half. Drive down in position, and Jason Sanders, as he always does, oh, yeah. is right down the middle on his Money. kick. Right, yep, right down the middle on his kick. So now instead of being 10 to 3 going to halftime, it's 7 to 6. And the Dolphins get the ball to start the second half, march down the field for a touchdown, and then it's from that point on they're in cruise control. So well, who, who, know, who knows how it would have played out? Sure. But still, it, 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 for a team as fragile, I would think, as Cincinnati, given their record, that didn't help. It was good to see the Dolphins respond uh, in the second half, and and Tua needed it. The, the, the offense needed it. So again, it wasn't really all that pretty early. But tell me what you think of the overall grade for Tua for the game. I think I recall giving him a B. The one, the one stat that's not good. The third down passing was bad. The Dolphins ended up one for ten on third that's down. That's not good. No, and the, and the third down they got was the last one of the game when they're running out the clock. So no, that's not good. Uh, I think Tua was 0 for 5 or 0 for 6 on third down. The one really poor throw he had the entire game was a third down slant to Jakeem Grant, who was open. And for some reason, I don't know if he, the ball slipped or what, but it wound up being really low bounce, like a foot in front of Jakeem. The Dolphins also were not good in the red zone, uh, although some of that was running plays or you could question the play calling at times as well. But the Dolphins still were actually goal to go situations. Forget red zone. They were 1 for 4 in goal-to-go situations. No, not good. And, here, no, and here's the key thing about this. Against the Jets and against Cincinnati, they can get away with that. Oh, yeah. Because their, their defense will shut them, shut them down. But now comes the meaty part of their schedule, starting with KC this weekend. That's not going to fly. Okay, so are, then can I say, were you a little bit – did at least two us – did he make – a little step forward, or did he make it a, a, a little bit more than a little step forward? I would say it was a solid, solid step, forward. step forward. Okay, yeah, no, he, he played very well. He had he had a couple of plays that were really really impressive. He had one play that was that was as good a play as the Dolphins have gotten from a quarterback all year, where he had an unrushing, uh, oncoming rusher right in his face. He basically just a very did a very quick sidestep to avoid him, and then he threw like a pass into a very tight window to Devontae Parker where only he could catch it. It was a low ball, and Devante made a really, really nice catch, and that produced, I think it may have been a nine-yard gain, but it should have been a sack, and it was just a great play on both ends. And then there was a play where he, where he stepped out of the pocket, rushed to his, scrambled to his left, and threw that 35-yard pass downfield to Miles Gaskin, which is another very, very impressive play. So absolutely, he made, he made big steps forward. And again, this was his first action since that regrettable Denver yes. game. So it was good to see him make those kinds of strides, no question. Yeah, because they're going to have to make even bigger strides, as you just talked about, offensively, if they're going to beat the Chiefs. That's for sure. Uh, because that's the type of game that you get the feeling of the way the Dolphins have played. Look, they've won seven out of eight. If you can find a way, any way at all, to beat the defending Super Bowl champs, even though there's three games left after that, and there are a lot of good teams jockeying for position, you kind of see uh, me not being a Dolphin fan or maybe even somebody that, you know, you, you cover them all the time. You have a reputation, obviously, the Dolphin fans, what you say and so forth. I might feel a little bit freer and just be and I don't know. You may feel the same way, but I would feel like, hey, if you can beat the Chiefs and win eight out of nine, you know what? You're going to make the playoffs. Oh, and there's no question that that's going to be the feeling precisely because of the caliber of team that they will have beaten. They're, if you look at their record so far this year, they are 8-4. and four. They have played only three teams that right now have a current, have a winning record, and they're 1-2 and two in those three mm -hmm. games. They beat the Rams, and then they lost to Buffalo and to Seattle. What they've done is they've beaten the teams they needed to beat. Now, I, I mentioned that they're going to the, the teeth of their schedule. The last... Four opponents they face have a combined record of 33 and 15. Oh, yeah. you, know what the, you know what the last four opponents that they faced had as a combined record? Nine, 38, and yeah. one. That's, that's a little bit of a difference. Absolutely. So, so that, the thing that they need to do is before they have the record right now and they're, a they're in a position to make a playoff run and to make the playoffs, they need to show they can beat really good teams for that to happen. And if they beat Kansas City, then you've answered that question. And then, yeah, absolutely, you, you start thinking – they're definitely making the playoffs. A big game, too, uh, for Mike Kosicki, and that's something that the Dolphins and Kosicki need because they really – he's got the talent, 
at this stretch of the season now, with these big games coming up, if the Dolphins are going to make a push to the playoffs and they're going to get to the playoffs, they have to find that secondary guy. And we, we, and we, this week is a great example of what tight ends can do with Travis Kelsey and the Chiefs. And, and, and Gasicki's got ability. He's got that type of ability. He's got a ways to go if he's ever going to be that type of player, but he has that type of ability. And in, he had a really good game against a bad team. The next step is to do it against a really good team. Correct. Well, and it wasn't his first good game. He's had like two or yep. three, and then he he goes to like big through big lulls. So it's kind of been an interesting thing. The thing with him is he can catch any ball because of his athletic ability. The, the, the one issue with Mike Gesicki is the route running sometimes isn't as crisp as you'd like it. For example, you mentioned Travis Kelsey, and we talked to Eric Rowe yesterday, and he talked about Travis Kelsey running routes like a wide receiver, while Mike Gesicki runs routes like a tight end. And sometimes you will find situations where you see a lot of passes thrown his way where there's tight coverage on him. Well, that's because he's not creating enough separation. That needs to be more consistent for him to reach that next level. If he can get open, you can see he's got the ability to make those catches, including that circus one-handed catch he had against the Bengals near, I think it was around the five-yard line. So it's there. And as you mentioned, because right now they don't have a defendable number two wide receiver to complement Devontae Parker, they really need for Gesicki to, to be consistent and to make plays week in and week out. And speaking of the depth, you mentioned Grant. He actually had a pretty big drop in the game against the Bengals, which could have been a huge play. Uh, and we, we talked about whether or not he could step up and be a guy that with Tua around, you know, could he be somebody that could elevate his game? Meanwhile, Isaiah Ford, I guess there's a possibility the Dolphins are going to re-sign him now that he's been let go by the Patriots. And Antonio Callaway gets an opportunity to play, but he only gets 13 snaps. So they're still looking. And, and by the way, Lynn Bowden comes in for Perry. He gets four receptions, which is good to see that he's getting some opportunities. So there's still a, a, you know, a mismatch of guys, depth guys, that the Dolphins are hoping that maybe, a, you know, you don't need anybody to step up and be a true number two or anything like that. But the more depth players can step up and really help out the offense, it's just going to make the offense better. No, no question. And, and Bowden showed a lot of good things last week where I want to see more. I mean, he caught all four passes thrown his way. They handed him the ball one time, and he made some really nice moves, gained 11 yards. Uh, there's something there. I want to see more out of him. I want to see him get more opportunities. Yes. The, other, the other thing is you mentioned Callaway and Ford, and I caution against falling into the trap. Dolphin fans do this all the time. Callaway was a shiny name because of what he did at the University of Florida. Fourth round pick had a good rookie year with the Browns where he shined all of a sudden once he started practicing for the Dolphins. I know a lot of fans are thinking that's the guy who's going to make a difference. No, he's not making a difference. He's played three games. He hasn't played more than 13 snaps in any of them, was not targeted once in the 13 snaps he played against the Bengals. So obviously it's a work in progress. Isaiah Ford, who I, who I really respect as a, as a person, Great kid, great work ethic, team player, will do everything he's asked without complaining. But the, there's, I mean, there was a reason why he bounced on and off the Dolphin practice squad for three years before making a little bit of an impact late last year. And there's a reason why he never played in his three games where he was eligible with the Patriots, yep. who wound up, by the way, throwing the Dolphins a draft pick just for the opportunity to look at <laughs> him. So, I mean, as much as I like to see the guy, like, come on like gangbusters after after – starting on the practice squad and then eventually earning a promotion. I, I would caution against expecting too much. You don't usually at this and more Callaway. Yeah. At this, at this time of the year, it never happens where a guy just comes off the practice squad and becomes a key part of the offense. It just doesn't happen. So maybe for next well, year, but. I, I will, but I will tell you this, the dolphins actually got a couple of those guys late last year, not in the, in the sense of making a major impact, but they picked up Zach Sealer, for example, off waivers from the Ravens in December last year. And in his limited playing time in the games he played, it was like, well, there, there might be something sure. there. And lo and behold, there was. Andrew, Andrew Van Ginkle spent most of the year on IR. And in, in December, there were a couple of games where he made some plays. And you're like, yeah, there's something there. And then it's carried over to this year. So you're not going to see a guy who's really going to make the difference between wins and losses down the stretch. That's unrealistic. Yeah. But 
certainly possible. Like, for example, what Bowden did against the Bengals, those are the types of glimpses that tell you that maybe next year, yeah, that, that could be a major. Yeah, factor. and if you get a whole offseason where you have Perry and, and Bowden, college quarterbacks, transferring to you know, running back receiver, whatever you want, weapons on offense, and they get into game action, you get a full off season with them next this off season. These, these, I mean, these kids were fantastic playmakers at the college level, division at top yep. college level, not in the Mac, you know, not in the Sun Belt, in the top, co- you know, Navy's still considered still, you know, they with Perry, they were a dangerous team and Bowden, it's amazing how they were able to win games with him at quarterback. He doesn't throw the football very much at all, and yet they were still able to win games. It's like the Dolphins back in the days of the Wildcat. So you got these two guys that have playmaking ability. It'd be nice to see next year if you can really implement them into the offense and make them a part of uh, you know a nice weaponry. Uh, and and I think those guys wind up sticking out more when you do get the the, the, the higher profile guys that really make it more dangerous for the opposition to go, Hey, we got to take care of Parker. we got to take care of Gasicki. We've got to take care of this guy. Then you can throw in the Perry and the Bowdens. And all of a sudden you've got something really kind of cool. Yeah, no question. And like I said, I want to see more uh, from Bowden after what he did last week. I want the Dolphins to feature him a little bit more. He, you could see the athletic ability yes. just in the way he handles, he handles the ball and the way he moves. Oh yeah. In space, in space, so there's no reason not to give him more opportunities. Uh, on defense, uh, Jones gives up the touchdown. Um, just a just a blip. Well, it, it's it's a bad combo played by both him and Brandon Jones. It's a third and two. It starts off like for some reason I don't understand why Byron Jones was so far off the line because he was guarding Tyler Boyd. So it's an easy pitch and catch for the first down. You start off with that. And it's basically a gift because they're so far off yeah. the line. Now, what the problem what the problem became is that Brandon Jones got himself tangled with tight end Drew Sample and couldn't disengage where he was close enough to the sideline where had he been able to come loose a little bit, he'd have been in a position to just simply shove Boyd out of bounds and avoid that whole that whole issue. But he got completely, completely neutralized. And then Jones with the angle he had couldn't get to Boyd quickly enough to where to prevent being basically boxed out by, by Sample and, and his, his own teammate, and there goes Boyd. So it happens. It's, yes, it happens. It's not a great play for either for Byron Jones. I don't think Brandon Jones also necessarily did, the, did his job on that particular play either. Even though if you look at the advanced stats, it's an awful – Sure. It's a 72-yard touchdown against Byron Jones, which yeah. – which which makes his passer rating against jump up exponentially. I think Byron Jones m- might have been somehow. I don't know. Maybe he. Maybe he. Byron Jones and Lamar Jackson for the Jets were somehow switched in their bodies for those plays because Byron Jones was playing deep and Lamar Jackson was playing tight. So yeah, uh, it happens. Uh, or, yeah, it's a bad. It's a. It was a bad play. Yeah, I don't think anybody. Uh, okay. Now, and, and Eric Rowe gets the opportunity to cover Travis Kelsey. So that's going to be a big matchup for him. He's had a strong season against tight ends. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, it's a great matchup. Looking forward to it. And Eric Rowe, if people weren't sold on him before, what he did against George Kittle of the 49ers. And obviously the big difference there is that George Kittle had Jimmy Garoppolo and C.J. Beathard throwing him the ball that day. Travis Kelsey's going to have Patrick Mahomes. So obviously that's a big difference. But Eric Rowe has shown all year he can cover tight ends and maybe part of the reason is because he's a former cornerback. Yes. And unless you're dealing with a Gronk, who's a whole different problem because of his size, if the biggest issue you're dealing with Travis Kelsey is that he basically runs routes like a wide receiver, well, Eric Rowe has seen that. So I have some degree of confidence he can do a good job against him. Whether he shuts him down the way he shut down Kittle, who had four catches for 44 yards, is that realistic? Is that expecting too much? Yeah, probably. But as long as you don't let you don't let Kelsey go for I don't know eight catches, 120 yards, that would be a problem. So I, if it's somewhere down down the line, somewhere down the middle, I mean, no tight ends caught more 
for caught passes for more than 55 yards against the Dolphins this season. So you you hold Kelsey to 70 yards, I think they'd be happy with that. Uh, Ro, is he the slot corner? No. The slot corner is Nick, Nick Needham, Needham, who has done nothing but get better and better and better and better and better. And he was, to me, he was a weakness on defense early in the year, and now he's, he's actually a strength. He's played really, really well. So when the Dolphins, when their, their regular defense then, how do they run it specifically? Like, like first down for the Chiefs, how, how do, how, who were who the DBs that are out there for the Dolphins? And who were they covering? Well, well they're going to, against the Chiefs, it wouldn't surprise me if they started off with six DBs, okay. uh, even, even more than, than five. And then so, so the extra guy comes in specifically because of they've got a weapon at tight end. No, because you expect the Chiefs to spread them out and to throw the ball. And because I, my expectation is they're going to put Rowe on Kelsey and tell him, do your thing. Uh, the, the question is, is who's going to be the, the sixth AB? My guess it will be Brandon Jones, the rookie from Texas, the aforementioned Brandon Jones, uh, to go along with your four regular starters, uh, Byron Jones, Xavier Howard, Bobby McCain, Eric Rowe, and then Nick Needham, your slot corner. Okay. All right. So I, I, my, my expectation is there'll, there'll be a lot of man stuff against Kelsey, maybe with some help at times. The bigger concern and the bigger issue is how do you cover Tyreek Hill? I know it's been suggested or it's fascinating to say, well, he's one of the best wide receivers in the league. Xavier Howard's one of the best corners in the league. Why don't you put Howard on Hill one-on-one? Except except Hill's kind of a different kind of wide yeah, receiver. Yeah, his speed alone is uh, just it's different. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Because what Howard, what, where, where Howard excels, Howard has above average speed. I don't know if I could say great speed. What he has is great rod recognition and incredible ball skill. The problem is, is what Tyreek Hill has is incredible speed. Yeah. So my, my guess is it's going to be combination coverages and safety help. Should be interesting to see how that works. Oh, how absolutely. The defense lines up. That should be good. But again, the yep. Dolphins now are in a position where even if they lose to the Chiefs, the, the Patriots come next. And a lot's going to depend on what the Patriots do on Thursday night. And let's say the Patriots win on Thursday. That, and let's say the Dol- Dolphins lose. They're supposed to lose. That's what that's what everybody's going to expect. Then all of a sudden, now you have a you know the game of the year because you're taking on a team that's already beaten you, and if they beat you again, tiebreaker wise, you're in big trouble. So it's it's going to get pretty tricky mm-hmm. here. And it's going to happen fast, starting with the Chiefs on Sunday. And it's just, it's amazing. But if this is what you sign up for as a fan and, and, and as a team, these types of challenges. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's going to be fun to watch and see how they respond. Yeah, you know, and then the thing with New England is they, they I mean, they look, they look dead, what, two, three weeks ago. And all of a sudden, they've gotten their game together. They did a number on Justin Herbert. I mean, the Dolphins made Justin Herbert look bad. The Patriots made him look horrible. Uh, and then th- this followed a pattern with Bill Belichick causing major headaches for rookie oh, yeah. quarterbacks. Well, guess what? Two was a rookie quarterback. So what's Belichick going to come up with against the Dolphins? Good point. The other problem is the other problem is what the New England does best on offense right now is run the ball. What's the Dolphins' weakness on defense is stopping the run. So in terms of matchups, New England is not a good matchup for the Dolphins right now. So. I think the, the one thing they've got going for him is that they do have this little like kind of hex on New England when they come to Miami. It's been a it's been a tough place for New England to win football games. That is true. That is true. No question about. It. Well, well, not last year though. It wasn't a problem no, last no. year, but that that's an eternity yeah, ago though. Absolutely. And and a whole different ball game. I mean, a different team. I should uh, say. Yep. So uh, wow, it's it's going to be great. I'm looking. For, I mean, this is really what 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 like I said, what you <laughs> sign up for. So. It was also nice to see Gaskin come off the injury list and it uh, looked like he just picked up where he left off a 90 yard performance, including really 141 yard performance when he throw in the, the uh, two receptions for 51 yards. So that was nice to see. Yeah, he was solid, but again, I mean, I don't, I don't want to like be this guy who like changes my turn every week. I, I have said the dolphins don't have an impact running back and they still don't. Miles sure. Gaskin's a nice player and he did a nice job. 
But again, when we talk about this, this game against Cincinnati and the game against the Jets before, it's really impossible not to not to overlook the fact that they were playing two really, really, really bad teams. And this is why this game against Kansas City is going to tell us a whole lot because you want to talk about a measuring stick type of game. That's it right, right there. So, I mean, let's see what the Dolphins can do against them. But, yeah, it would be nice if, if they can get some production out of the running game against Kansas City, which is not does not have a great run defense. And if you're able to control the ball against them, well, I keep Patrick Mahomes on the sideline, which obviously is the best defense to play against him. It's just, again, that that's not what the Dolphins necessarily do well. And with Edwards Hilaire missing the game against Denver, maybe on Bell becoming the starter – I, you know, it, it's, I don't know what it is, but, you know, even when Bell was on the Jets his last few games, he looked a lot better than he's done with the Chiefs. I don't even, I don't know if it's he needs time to gel with his line or what the situation is, but he does not look good for Kansas City right now. And when they, when you, when you can get away from, when, when you make Kansas City a one dimensional offense, especially the Chiefs. That makes things a little bit easier for you because, yeah, you don't want to always have Patrick Mahomes throwing the football. I get it. But they are that much more dangerous when they can run the football. And when you eliminate the running game. Now, again, Edward Tiller could play this week. But if you can eliminate, like you said, Dolphins run defense, not very good. That's really where you're gonna, Dolphins are going to have to step up because if they allow the Chiefs to have a really good game running the football, I just don't really see how they're going to be able to stop them. No, no question. And they have to affect Mahomes, even though the thing with Mahomes is you can have great pressure on him. He finds a way to scramble, makes those crazy throws with all sorts of arm angles, stop, stop in mid-run, plant his foot throw across his body. I mean, he does all sorts of crazy things that just drive you nuts as an opponent because you played the, you played the play really, really well, and he still makes something happen because he's such an athlete. But that's what you got to keep doing and doing and doing. And eventually you hope that there's a mistake there. The other thing with him, he never throws picks. So, but so he's going again, going against Xavier Howard, who always gets a pick. So something's yeah. going to have to give there. Well, that's why we're looking forward to it. Looking forward. This is, this is the type of defense that should have the most success against the Chiefs, or at least I'm talking about the secondary. Because if you have DBs that can cover their guys, that's, that's huge. That's a, that's a big step up. Vic Fangio did a good job last week. You know, we've mm-hmm. seen the Chiefs are, are they're human. You know, they, they can have bad games. They could have games where they look human, like Patrick Mahomes. And Brian Flores is one of the top defensive minds in, in the NFL. And I, I think this could be that's why I'm real excited to see the matchup, because I don't I, I think this is I think this is really all going to depend, to tell you the truth, on the offense. Uh, the, the offense has, has got to play with the Chiefs, and I'm not saying 45, even 30s, but you know, maintain some time on the clock. You know, run the ball effectively. Short passes. Don't go one for 11 on third downs. You can't do that against mm-hmm. the Chiefs. So if the offense plays a really good football game, uh, the Dolphins are going to have a chance. I don't care how good the Dolphins play on defense. If the offense doesn't respond, they're not going to beat the Chiefs. Agree, because no matter how well they play on defense, you're not going to completely shut no. them down. They're just too good for that. We to saw happen. that on Sunday. But night. I do, correct. They didn't play a good game. They still scored 22 yep. points. They, but as you, I'm with you on that though. That I trust Brian Flores to come up with a good game plan to try to slow down, contain a little bit the Chiefs' offense, and it will be up to the offense to make enough plays to see if they can pull out this one. All right, well, we'll talk about that next week, and then obviously we'll uh, harp on the, the the big one after that. That's the Patriot game, and uh, that should be even uh, even more fun, especially if the Patriots win, which I you know Dolphin fans don't want to see. But No, Dolphin fans don't want to hear that, but it wouldn't make the matchup it would more be, interesting. Yeah. But no question about All it. All right, Alan. Thanks as always. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Have a good you one, too. Greg.